Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased and honored to be here this afternoon. And uh, I'm very delighted for the invitation. I want to thank the organizer, the Biomin, and my very good friend uh, for this kind of invitation. I understand that this is not the very good time uh, for give a presentation and for listen to my presentation. I will try to do my best to make my presentation as simple as possible. Uh, my presentation uh, uh, will focus uh, on the vaccination strategies in the post-antibiotic uh, era. So what does it mean? It means that uh, we already learned this morning in the two previous uh, presentations, that uh, we have different tools to reduce, uh, to substitute uh, antibiotics. Okay, now it's clear. We need to apply a different strategy. We need to apply the strategy based on the so-called prudent use of antibiotic. And I want to contribute to this uh, new approach to animal diseases, uh, showing you something about uh, the immune system and the vaccination, because uh, vaccination is a very important, the most important tool for prevention. Okay? So the concept uh, is. Uh, one Health. One Health is a, a very new, a very new terminology, okay? Um, I want to remind you, for instance, that in some university, there are teachers that teach about One Health, and this is uh, interesting, in my opinion, just to highlight the importance of this concept. Uh, the terminology is new, but nothing is new about the interaction of the three main areas, the animal, the humans, and the environment. And you see that uh, the connection and the overlapping of these circles are ecology from animal and environment, uh, translational medicine from human medicine and animal and veterinary medicine, and so on. I have told you nothing new because we already know this concept. It was uh, the traditional perspective of the so-called public health. Since a few years ago, it was public health. But nowadays, it's one health. Why? Because the, we have different conditions. Okay? You can check the overlapping of the three concepts veterinary medicine, human medicine, and the environment, and you can see that the, the overlapping is wider. There's a more and more involvement and more and more interaction between human medicine, animal medicine, and the environment. This is the so-called One Health, and we are just focusing on these aspects. This is the reason why now we have to take care and we have to improve the prudent use of antibiotic. It doesn't mean that we have to avoid the use of antibiotic. It means that we have to uh, approach, differently approach, uh, um, the use of antibiotic. So I want to highlight that my point of view is the point of view of a vet. I am a veterinarian, you know? so not an agronomist, not a nutritionist, I am a veterinarian. So my mind setting is typically based on animal health. I'm sorry for that. Okay. Responsible use of antibiotics. Everything seems new, but uh, it's not new. This concept, responsible or prudent use of antimicrobial, is not a new concept. Uh, 25 years ago, we started discussing about the reduction of antibiotics. It was not urgent. It was not an emergency, like it is nowadays. 
because we already know that uh, in 2050, eh? Lotto Begian, in the, his first presentation, launched that uh, the most important cause of that in 2050, roughly, uh, in 2050, will be connected with the antibiotic resistance. And the mortality due to the infection by an antibiotic resistant microorganism should be higher than mortality because of cancer. So we have to think about that eh, a little bit. So back to the responsible use of antimicrobials, um, we have to apply reduction, replacement, uh, and rationality. Uh, this was a, not a new concept, but is the basis of the prudent use. Again, we have to remind that we cannot eliminate the use of antibiotics because from a veterinary perspective, from a, the perspective of the animal health, we have uh, an ethical issue as veterinarians that we have to treat animals, we have to treat sick animals. And treating sick animals means that we must use antibiotic. But the use of antibiotic must be prudent. And prudent means that we have to apply antibiotic after or upon a correct diagnosis. So it's not new, but again, we have to go back to the, to the basis of the uh, therapeutic uh, strategy. And uh, moreover, antimicro antimicrobial cannot uh, be considered as, as an umbrella protecting against lacking uh, of uh, management, environment, biosecurity, welfare, and so on. For a long time, we have tried to counterbalance lacking uh, in different aspects uh, of our system using antibiotic. Okay. Now we have to rethink everything. And we learned something this morning about the importance of biosecurity. Our management can improve the efficiency and the health of our animal to reduce the role of this umbrella. And it takes time because it's a matter of mind setting, but that's the right direction. Implementation of the strategy for disease prevention, and here we have different options, management, environment, biosecurity, nutrition. We'll attend the next speaker about nutrition, vaccination now, but we must, we must highlight genetic, because in my opinion, genetic is uh, the new aspect for animal disease prevention. So, genetic means uh, the selection or just the capacity to find those genomes that are responsible for the susceptibility to some diseases and work on that. And this is the new frontier of animal health. Not next year, unfortunately, but in the next 10, 20 years, I think that it will be a very, very, uh, a very, very easy point to be reached. I want to highlight, for instance, that there are congresses that are based on the role of genetic in the prevention of diseases. Four days of discussion based on that relation. Okay? So that's just an idea for uh, thinking about that. And now I am approaching the, the, uh, the, the core of my presentation. The immune system, just uh, about the immune system, I have to 
summarize something very important. First of all, the immune system starts to be, uh, the development of the immune system starts uh, very soon after conception. Okay? So, and uh, at the last third uh, of gestation, we very well know uh, that uh, the immune system is competent. The, the fetuses can have an immune response. That's very true, because at that time, we have both components of the immune system, the innate immunity and the adaptive immunity, the red area and the green area, that are active. And at birth, both components are mature. Okay. Then after birth, we have the increase of both the component, innate and the adaptive immunity, okay? And at weaning, both components uh, are present and are perfectly, perfectly active, okay? But what happened during this period, from birth to weaning and from weaning to puberty? You see that the, these areas are changing a little bit. Yes, they are changing because we have a, a different setting of the immune system, but the immune system, both components, the innate immunity and the adaptive immunity, are active since the beginning of the life of the animal. So it means that when we vaccinate animals, for instance, in the first weeks of life, we vaccinate immune competent animal, their immune system is uh, very well functioning, differently functioning as compared to the immune system of the adults, but it's functioning. Okay, and uh, what do we expect in terms of clinical protection? Okay, I, I, I want the glass to represent the vaccination, the vaccinated pigs, and uh, the liquid, in this case beer, because we are in countries uh, where beer is uh, very, very famous. In Italy it's fine, or in Spain, but uh, in Austria, in Germany, in Belgium, it's beer, okay? and in Czech Republic also, okay? Um, and uh, different, okay, 100% of protection, the glass is full, 80% or the glass is uh, empty and uh, we have no protection. And here we have different option, okay, and different response of uh, a population, in this case, uh, to a vaccination. In this first case, option A, we have 80% of protection. We have few animals that are non-responders. They are not able to react to the immunological stimulus. Then we have a group B, 80% of protection is the same. But you see that the same because the whole population has 80% of protection. What is the best option, comparing the two different, uh, option A or option B? We don't know. Eh? It depends. It depends on the type of infection. It depends of different uh, aspects. And then option C. This is uh, none of the animals have under percent of protection, and the overall protection is 70 percent. This picture is uh, just to introduce the next concept about uh, what do we expect from vaccination and uh, what do we expect uh, from the immune system. So it's very simple and uh, I want to uh, refresh and to, yeah, yes, to give you a, an overview shortly, eh? an overview, the recognition of non-self agent Okay, it's something that uh, do not belong to the, to the animal, okay? Everything, uh, non-self, is uh, treated by the immune system. It's a very, very complex. Huh? 
and uh, we have the immune response. And uh, con as a consequence of the immune response, we have the clinical and the immunological protection, and this is what we expect from a vaccination. When we vaccinate a pig, we expect that the animal is protected. It's protecting in terms of clinical science, no disease. In fact, what we can obtain is a complete a no disease, okay? And I mean, in some cases, the vaccination or the uh, stimulus to the immune system is not complete or is not active, and we have the death of the animals, okay? It depends on the protection on what we have obtained in this, it depends on this figure, okay? Here, yeah. if it's non empty, non protected, probably it will die, okay? But the, this uh, uh, evolution, this uh, uh, pathway, is uh, situation dependent and depends on the infectious agent, it depends on the environment, of the animal status. We have to realize once again the age. The age of the animal is very important. So, in the pig population, so we know that we are always yeah, handling young animal eh, because at slaughter weight, at six months, they are still young. But when we compare the immune response in a young pig, six, seven, eight months, and uh, an adult pig, a sow or a boar, things are completely different, okay? And in particular, I want to remind you that unfortunately, aging, uh, in general term, means that the, your hair became a little bit uh, silver, okay? And, uh, but also that the, the immune system as a sort of aging and reduction of the efficiency of the immune system. This is one of the collateral effect, adverse event of aging in man and in animal. Okay? But anyway, and the concurrent infection. Sometimes the best option to control a disease is to control the infection that are the infections that are co-infecting uh, the animal uh, or the pig population at that time. Okay, vaccination. Some example of clinical protection is very, very simple here. You see, eh? uh, infected animal, vaccinated animal, it's uh, very easy to understand. This is the severity of the disease in a non-vaccinated animal and the, the reduction of the severity of the disease in vaccinated animal. That's what we mean, clinical protection, a reduction of the body temperature, two different curve, vaccinated animal and unvaccinated, non-vaccinated animal are shown in this picture. Here is very, very clear, vaccinated animal, Vaccinated animal, sorry, non-vaccinated animal and infected. Uh, the difference is in the curve of the temperature in uh, vaccinated animal is different, completely different as compared to the uh, course of the curve of uh, temperature in uh, uh, non-vaccinated animal. Body temperature is a parameter for clinical protection but one of the most important uh, clinical parameters is uh, the average daily weight gain. Here you can see uh, during an infection the effect of the infection on the average daily weight gain is uh, evident. The red uh, bar uh, represents the average daily weight gain in uh, infected, non-vaccinated animal vaccinated animal, and so on. Another measure of the clinical protection is, uh, so, clinical signs, hmm? fever, average daily weight gain, mortality. And about mortality, I want to, I do not want to go into detail because it's a little bit uh, difficult, but uh, I want to uh, 
show you that uh, if we compare vaccinated pigs and uh, control pigs uh, and vaccinated pig against the PCV2, and uh, when we speak about PCV2, we have a clear idea what does uh, PCV2 means. Eh? And uh, in this case, uh, the vaccinated animal had the probability with a single dose of vaccine to suffer from PCVD 12 times less than the unvaccinated pigs. What does it mean? What that, it means that uh, in a vaccinated population, we can expect 12 times less disease as compared to unvaccinated pigs. And uh, to go back to the antibiotic, okay? And uh, this parameter, okay, mortality, 12 times less, run together with uh, the morbidity, let's say the reduction of the disease. And one of the parameters to measure the morbidity, so the amount of uh, disease, is the number of uh, injection per day. Number of injection per day, what does it mean? Uh, number of injection of what? Injection of antibiotic. And injection of antibiotic in this case, in the same case, 12 times less PCVD, the former slide, in this slide, 30% more injection, 30% more injection in the control pigs. So, you see, injection in this case are not for the treatment of PCV2, because PCV2 infection is a viral infection. We treat animal because of co-infection, for other infection. And this is a proof that in a vaccinated population, reducing the effect of some infection that are, are playing a, a role in, the, uh, in opening. Uh, I don't want to use the very old uh, uh, sentence, op door opening, but they open something to other infection causes of the disease and the mortality of the animal. Back to vaccination. Okay, that's a very difficult uh, point of my presentation. I have to stay in this short range because of the camera. Okay, and just, uh, yeah. So, infection, the list of infection and the, what we perceive in terms of vaccine efficacy. So the efficacy of a vaccination is a matter of perception. Unfortunately, in the field, we are not able, we cannot measure that. We can measure in experimental condition. We can measure the average daily weight gain of the animals, and that's uh, uh, important tools. Okay. We can measure mortality and morbidity, but not always easy. So we know that we have some very efficacious vaccines. Ojeski disease vaccines are very efficacious. PCV2 vaccines are very efficacious. We know eh? we have a, a very, very recent experience of the high level of efficacy of uh, PCV2 vaccines in general terms. Swine influenza, porcine parvovirus, also swine fever vaccine are working very well, okay, when used. Eh? In, in some area of the world, of course, not in Europe, not in USA, but uh, in Asia. Uh, but we always have some very challenging situation when we have to face uh, actinobacillus pleuro pneumonia infection, when we have to face mycoplasma of pneumonia, glasser disease, streptococcus suis. You see, uh, I. I put uh, not a very enthusiastic uh, if perception of efficacy. APP, we know that we have, it depends on the type of vaccines, okay? I do not want to go into detail. We can use this slide as a starting point for our discussion, okay? But uh, 
APP vaccination is a challenging vaccination. We know that uh, the, vaccin uh, the vaccines based on uh, uh, the inactivated uh, toxin are working uh, against the old serotypes, but uh, sometimes that's not sufficient. Uh, mycoplasma of pneumonia. Uh, mycoplasma of pneumonia. The vaccines are on the market uh, in Europe since uh, 1996. Uh, 1996. Okay, so more than 20 years. Okay, of vaccination with uh, uh, mycoplasma of pneumonia. We were very happy about that, but now after more than 20 years, we are realizing all over Europe, all over the world, or also in the USA, that there is something that is not working uh, very well, working as expected. Okay? We have some lack of efficacy. There is something that uh, is not uh, very, very um, efficacious in uh, mycoplasma or pneumonia vaccination. What's the reason? Oh, different reasons. But in my opinion, the first reason is because we are not able to trigger the immune system in the site of infection. We inject intramuscularly or intradermally inject mycoplasma or pneumonia vaccines. We obtain a very good or a good uh, systemic immunity. But what we need with mycoplasma or pneumonia infection is a local immunity. And local immunity is not stimulated when we inject animal intramuscularly. So I think that we have to rethink, and I'm sure that the pharma company are rethinking to this strategy, okay? Ah, but that's, you say, okay, it's very simple, Paolo, okay? We prepare an oral vaccine. But what I want to highlight is that uh, if we don't have an a intranosal or an oral vaccine for mycoplasma, that's due to the fact that we are not still able to prepare a vaccine able to stimulate, to, to elicit an immune response when we administer it from a different route of administration. That's the next generation of vaccine, that's what we expect uh, in the next 20, 30 years, okay? So E. coli, uh, E. coli is very, very interesting because uh, E. coli was uh, for a long time a very, very uh, challenging infection with uh, intramuscular vaccines. Uh, we sometimes obtain very good, very good uh, results, sometimes uh, it fails. So this is the reason why I put here uh, minus and plus, okay, it depends. But very recently, we have on the market uh, vaccines that uh, are very promising in terms of uh, uh, E. coli protection. The vaccine that uh, are, uh, have as an antigen the, um, the fimbriae, and uh, this is the reason why they uh, induce a specific immunity to those uh, uh, specific uh, um, pathogenic, uh, the specific uh, uh, part of the microorganism that plays a very important role in the pathogenesis of the E. coli infection. But next point. Uh, 15 minutes. Uh, next point uh, is uh, herd immunity. Herd immunity means uh, create uh, a resistance of a population to an infection and to the spread of an infection because of the immunity of a large percentage of the population. So herd immunity is a very common term used also in uh, uh, human medicine. Okay, the term is herd immunity, also for human, okay? It means that the world population is at the same immune status um, at the same time. And uh, the level can be altered when we introduce susceptible animals. 
So uh, that's even a very important uh, uh, aspect. Do you remember about Ojeski disease? Uh, one of the one of the most important uh, most important tools to eradicate Ojeski disease infection is uh, vaccination, and this strategy fails when we have a subpopulation of animals that are not properly vaccinated against Ojeski disease. This is a clear example of the importance of herd immunity. But we have also we have to consider that uh, we can have uh, changes in the level of the we have, can have changes in the pathogen and uh, please consider for instance influenza but in particular for pig the, 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 the most important example is uh, purge okay and we can have uh, antigenic variability with a very high variability with a low variability and a the variability of the genetic setting of the virus is uh, important uh, in terms of uh, herd immunity. But uh, I want to show you, this is a very simple picture. Eh? You see, eh? we have uh, different, uh, different uh, dots. The yellow dots are the vaccinated, the blue dots are unvaccinated, and the black are the infected. So please, uh, we can start uh, with this, with this, okay, area. You see, the 95 percent, 95 percent of the population is vaccinated, yellow, okay, unvaccinated, the blue, okay, and in this condition, okay, here, the blue and the yellow. In this condition, we have only few infection, the red bar. The red um, bar, yeah. 90 percent, a little bit more red is here. 75 percent, again, more, 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 and more. And the first on the left percent of vaccinated animal, zero. No animal are vaccinated, and the infection can spread, easily spread everywhere. Okay, within the population. What we want is to have a high vaccinated population as much as high as possible, and in this condition, the level of uh, transmission is very, very low. This is the very well known uh, reproduction ratio greater than one, less than one, and one. Uh, uh, I only want to show you this very easy picture. Very, very easy. Okay, we have two different groups of animals. We have uh, unvaccinated animals here, and here we have vaccinated animals. So we infect the vaccinated animal with PERS virus here, and you see that we have infected animal. But when we compare with the uh, non-vaccinated animal, okay, we have a, a different patterns in this figure and in this one. Contact pigs are those two groups. They are pigs, they are in contact with the vaccinated animals, okay? And the in contact pigs with the vaccinated animal, we have only one infected pig here. And when we give a look to the in-contact pigs, in contact with the non-vaccinated animal, you see here the huge amount of the animal that become infected. This is a proof that uh, the vaccination on this population of animal, the vaccinated animal, have a reduced capacity of transmission of the virus. This is the meaning of the R number. And the R number is here represented to summarize what has been shown in the previous slides. Here you have the R value in the vaccinated pigs is 0.3, and the R value in non-vaccinated pigs is more than 5. What does it mean? So, 
R value less than one means that when we have one infected animal within a vaccinated population, the spread of the infection is very, very low and only 0.3 animal can become infected, when the infected with an infected animal. When we have five as R value, means that when we have one infected animal, other five animal in contact will become infected. And this is the reason why the infection keeps into the population and the, the, the spread of the infection is uh, uh, normally accepted, okay? Effect of uh, uh, herd immunity. So what about the are animal fully responders? So at the very end, I have to say that uh, animals are responders, but when, when we vaccinate a population, there is a proportion of animals that uh, are not responders. That's a normal thing. It happens also in the human being. And it happens also in pigs, or in poultry, in cattle. It's a, a matter of uh, physiology, okay? And uh, there is an example, for instance, here's an example, that after vaccination, the proportion of, uh, of a vaccinated animal, 100% of the animal are vaccinated, but uh, zero conversion occurs uh, only in a small proportion. Okay? That's expected. That's expected for some infection. That's expected uh, for in pigs, in human beings, okay? For other infection, we expect uh, 100% of zero conversion after vaccination. But we have to take into account that sometimes, sometimes we have uh, zero conversion, but uh, zero conversion is different as compared to protection. Sometimes, for some infection, okay, we have zero conversion, but uh, no protection. Because sometimes, what we use in our labs to demonstrate the zero conversion is not able to measure the level of protection. And that's a lack of our systems. Okay. What do we know uh, do we know uh, what affects the efficiency of the immune response? So, we are speaking, frequently speaking about uh, the responsiveness. No, we are speaking about uh, immune suppressive infection. Okay. So, infections can play a role in terms of uh, reduction of the immune response, but It's very difficult to say that uh, we have an immune suppression. What we have to face very frequently in our farms uh, in, uh, in Europe, in North America, are the effects, for instance, of PERS and of PCV2. I want, to, I want to keep the discussion within the, the more, most frequently uh, observe the uh, most frequently diagnosed infection. Okay, SPERS virus determines dysregulation of the immune system. PCV2 infection determines immune tolerance. None of these two infections is able to cause immune suppression. Immune suppression is something different. And that's a good point for discussion. But what I want to highlight uh, is the importance, uh, we have five minutes left, the importance uh, of the stress-related circumstances on the immune system and the effect uh, of nutrition and uh, mycotoxins. Uh, just uh, a few words on that. Uh, the immune system is very complex. Uh, it's a very complex uh, matter of interaction, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, um, chemical substances of type of cells uh, interact uh, when we have the immune 
stimulation, the immune the induction of the immune system. Here you can see a brief uh, a summary. Keep into your mind that uh, when we have an infection, the first line of defense is the innate immunity, and uh, the start of the effect of the innate immunity means that we want inflammation. Inflammation at that point is a very, very important part of the immune reaction. We cannot have an efficient immune reaction without inflammation. The problem is that sometimes inflammation okay, go over, okay, it's too much, and we have the disease. But at the very beginning of the, to have a, a good immune reaction, we need also inflammation. And inflammation runs together with innate immunity. Then we have the specific immunity, the memory, and everything is very well known. But what is not very well known and uh, not always clear, uh, that we have another important part of uh, the, uh, our re the reaction of the immune system that uh, is the neuroendocrine response. So it means that uh, at the meantime, we have the innate immunity, the adaptive immunity, but in the, in the meantime, we have also hormones that are working in order to control and shut down the defensive and the clearance of the microorganism. And these hormones are cortisol, Okay, and this is expected because when we speak about uh, inflammation, eh, we expect also cortisol. Okay, but in particular, one of the most important, one of the most important hormones involved uh, in the immune response uh, is GH, the growth hormone. So at the very end, when we have animals that are infected and sick, and those animals have very very poor performances. The poor performances are not correlated with the feed intake only, but they are the effect of the growth hormone and the, this neuroendocrine response on the immune system. And this is a very, very interesting uh, part of the immune reaction that has some importance in the future. Influence of mycotoxin on the susceptibility to disease so this is a very controversial, uh, uh, very controversial then discussion about that. Are mycotoxins disturbing, altering, eliciting something with the immune system? Okay, we have a very, very nice piece of paper in the international literature that uh, support a peer-reviewed journal, in peer-reviewed journal, that support the effect of mycotoxins on the efficiency of the immune response. And here you have a list, and uh, the effect of the different mycotoxin on the immune system are clearly stated, and I have summarized uh, the, the, this, the message of the different review, uh, peer review paper in these slides for the aflatoxin, and what is common on this uh, effect, on these effects of the, of the mycotoxins on the immune system is that the mycotoxin interacts with the very, very um, um, important part of the immune system. Not, not interact with the cells, with something that we can measure, but they interact with the cytokine. And the cytokines are what we are not able to measure. We, we cannot measure cytokine. We cannot, uh, uh, we have nothing to demonstrate uh, uh, that, from a diagnostic point of view, that uh, we have uh, a negative effect on the immune uh, system. Other mycotoxin, the oxidative stress, and then here, influence on the inflammatory response. Do you remember? I tell, okay, we need an inflammatory response. And we have a, an impairment of that. Here, we have an impairment on the cytokine expression, 
and you see here we have uh, the reference. Uh, I think that's not uh, written on the newsletter of uh, of the of the so of the football club. Okay. Ziralenon also. Okay. And, uh, and the same. We have the effect of mitotoxin also on the vaccination. And we have a list of effect of mycotoxin that can interact with the efficiency of uh, a vaccine and the efficacy, sorry, of the vaccination. For instance, the uh, yeah, for PERS, for Mycoplasma agalatia, not in pigs, but Salmonella cholera suis, uh, Ojeski disease, and so on. So at the very end, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention. This is a picture of my group of research, and uh, thank you for your attention. It was not easy to <laughs> listen, but thank you. <laughs>